there are quite a few graphs in the CAP698 document relating to Class A aircraft, basically to help us calculate various weights and distances, which is what we're going to have a little look at today. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the 15th and final class in the performance series. Today we're going to be taking a look at Class A related graphs. In the CAP698 document, there's loads of these graphs related to Class A performance aircraft, so I'm going to do a similar style to what I did for Class B performance. I'm going to pick out five or examples or so, we're going to run through them, I'll show you how to use the graphs, as well as how to use the CAP698 document if you forget anything, any little tricks, stuff like that, that hopefully you find very useful when it comes to exam time. Okay, so here we go, here's our first example. In this first question, we're trying to find out the landing distance required for the medium range jet transport Class A aircraft with the following information. Landing mass 51,000, pressure altitude 2,000, flaps 30, dry runway 10 knots and automatic spoilers and a working anti-skid system. So we're just going to use the graph and enter in all the information that we know and follow the example lines so we know what to do in terms of reference uh, lines and uh, these like guidelines. So first we have a mass of 51,000 kilograms, which is here. And I've already drawn in my example because when I was filming the class B stuff, I had to do a second take because when I was actually drawing them live, uh, all you could see was the back of my head because I was focused on where these lines are. So I'll highlight which lines I've drawn and uh, hopefully you'll understand why I've done it the way I have. Anyway, we've got 51,000 kilograms and then we've got pressure altitude of 2,000 feet and we have two groups of lines here. One for where the anti-skid is working and one where it's uh, inoperative on the right hand side. Which you can see is if we project it all the way down to the bottom of the fuel length available, then if we go from this and 2,000, we'd get about just under 8,000. And then when we have a working anti-skid system, it reduces all the way down to just below 5,000. So you can do a quick error check with all these sort of things. If the anti skid's working, it's going to reduce our field, um, our field, our landing distance. Uh, so you can error check what these guidelines are doing. And it's a quick way to figure out how the lines work if you're a bit stuck, for example. So anyway, we've got 51,000. Take that line all the way across until reaching 2,000 here. We then take the 2000 straight down until we enter the flap position uh, sort of correction. So we take that down to the flap 30 position, which is this sort of first kink in the line. We follow the reference line, sorry, the guideline down to the reference line and we stop. From that point, we're then looking at going straight down to correct for either a wet or a dry runway. If it was a wet runway, it would increase our distance. So we'd stop at the wet point, follow the guideline along, and that increases our total distance. So that's a, an error check again. We know that we're not going to correct and make our distance longer because we've got a dry runway. So we just continue all the way down to the next reference line. And then we continue down into the sort of wind correction area. If we have a tailwind, which we do in this case, it's going to increase our distance. So do we go to the reference line first or do we go to the wind first is the question. So if we went to the reference line first and then corrected for 10 knot tailwind, it would actually reduce the distance that we take because we'd hit the reference line, then follow the guideline down to where it crosses the 10 knot point, go straight down and get a shorter distance, which doesn't make sense because we know that tailwind will sort of push us down the one way as we uh, land and try to stop. So what we're going to do is we're going to go all the way down to the um, guideline first, the 10 knot, then follow the guideline up to the reference line, then take the reference line down for an answer which is about 5,700-ish. Uh, Let's call it 5,7. The answers available in the question were 9,950, 3,800, 5,725 and 6250. So we picked the closest one, which is obviously 5725 feet for some nice easy marks. So in this example, we are simply finding a climb limited takeoff mass from the graph with the following information. We've got 35 degrees Celsius, 2000 feet pressure altitude, flaps five, 
air conditioning packs off, anti-ice off, and PMC off, wherever that is. I have no idea what PMC is. But if it's off, then it's off. We don't have to worry about it. So quite a straightforward question, I think, mainly because the graph doesn't look too complicated. So let's enter the information that we know. We've got 35 degrees C, which is here. And then we project all the way up to a pressure altitude of 2,000 feet, coming up to this line here. And then from 2,000 feet, we go across to this first reference line, which is this point here. We then have two options. Uh, we use flat 5 or we use flat 15 here. We're using flat 5, so we're not going to follow any reference lines, uh, any guidelines. We're just going to go straight across for an answer of 57,000 kilograms exactly, which seems pretty reasonable because the answers given were for 53,700 kilograms, 57,000 kilograms, which we like, 57,900 kilograms and 52,800 kilograms. But one thing that I must stress about when using these graphs is you need to read the whole graph. You need to read these notes at the bottom and there's a little table at the bottom here, which if I slide up, you can see. You need to read these and take these into account to catch yourself, to catch any tricks and not do yourself out of marks. So these notes are normally to do with corrections should the configuration of our aircraft differ from that uh, ideal configuration used in the example. In our question, we have the aircraft packs off. So this is based on aircraft, uh, aircraft air conditioning packs in the auto position. For packs off, we increase the allowable mass by 900 kilograms. So in our case, with the air conditioning packs off, we have to increase our answer from 5,000, sorry, 57,000 to 57,900 kilograms if the anti-ice is off. The next correction is if the PMC is off, which is in our example. But when we're below 5,000 feet, we don't have to do any corrections. So our final answer is 5,000 no, it's not. It's 57,900 kilograms. So just watch out for these notes. Make sure you read them uh, and correct as appropriate. So in this next question, we're looking at the drift down graphs. There's quite a few, so make sure you select the right one. And there's lots of different information on these graphs with uh, three different values potentially we're able to find out, such as ground distance, time from engine failure, and the fuel burn from engine failure. Um, along this sort of curved line. So let's put in as much information as possible. We're starting from 33,000 feet, which is covered in this graph. So there's ones uh, over the page for you know 37,000 feet and uh, 32,000 feet. So make sure you're on the correct one, but you will get a little reference in the question so that you hopefully don't get too confused. So we're drifting down to 16,000 feet, which is here, and then we're gonna go straight across. 16,000 feet. Cool, that's one bit of information. Next, we need to work out our uh, mass equivalent at the engine failure, which is this figure here, which is what these numbers down the side equate to. So our starting mass is 58,050 kilograms. And we need to correct for the gross mass according to the ISA deviation here. But remember, we need to look for little notes and corrections depending on our configuration. So our configuration, we have the engine anti-ice on, which means we add 1950 to our mass. So we have a starting mass instead of 58,050, we have a starting mass of 60,000 exactly. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into this top right box and correct for any ISA deviation. Um, the ISA deviation today is minus 20. So this is 10 and below, this is 15 and this is 20. That's all positive. So we fall into this 10 and below category. So our correction for 60,000 goes straight across and is 60,000. We don't actually have to correct, but if it was ISA plus 20, for instance, you would see we could correct basically all the way up to 65. So we're looking at the 60,000 line, which is here. 
we're going to follow this guideline up to get to this point here and draw a line straight down. That means that we can find out a value for the time, which looks at about 31, 32 minutes, around that sort of mark. And we have a fuel burn down the side of about halfway between 1,000 and 1,500, let's call it 1,250 for argument's sake. So we've got two values. We need to find a third one, which is our ground distance covered. So if we went straight down, all the way down, that would be in a no wind condition. For us, we have a tailwind component, which is gonna push us further along the ground if we have an engine failure. So we're expecting to follow the guidelines down to the right from the reference line in order to increase our ground distance covered. So when we draw straight down, we hit the reference line, we stop, and then we think about correcting for the tailwind. Tailwind will be sending us down. So if we go down along to 25 knots, which is this line here, we go down following the guideline and then straight down to the bottom for a value of about 180 nautical miles. We then have to go into the question and select the correct combination of time, fuel burn and distance, which out of the options available, the closest ones were 31 minutes with 182 nautical miles and 11.50 kilograms on the fuel burn. This next example isn't using a graph as such, but I thought it was a good one to use anyway. So we're asked to calculate the V speeds with the following information. We weigh 60,000 kilograms. We're at a pressure altitude of uh, 1,500 feet. It's 25 degrees Celsius. It's flat five. We have a five knot tailwind and it's a 1% downslope. So a quick look at these tables, and I can see that we have some slope wind corrections for V1. So we're going to have to take that into account. And then down the bottom, we have stuff talking about VMCG. We're only asked for V1, VR, and V2. So we can essentially ignore this table. And right at the bottom, just off screen there, there we go, uh, we can see we've got a stabilizer trim setting, which again, we're not asked for. So what I'm going to do is just ignore these bottom two, but I will have to think about anything for this uh, top section. So what we're going to do is we're going to enter the information we know, which is 60,000 kilograms and a temperature of 25 and an altitude of 1,500 feet. And this is where it started to confuse me when I was looking at this example, because look, we've got 60,000 kilograms here, we've got 60,000 kilograms there, we've got 60,000 kilograms there, which is fine for our corrections later on. But what's all this A, B, C, D, E, F business going on? And I was a bit confused by this and I sort of defaulted to what I always do when I'm stuck and there's a question that allows me to use the CAP 698 is I look at the information around. And just by looking over onto the previous page, I saw this graph which has A, B, C, D, E and F. And I couldn't remember this from when I sat my exams, but a quick read through the notes at the top uh, will basically tell us which category we fall into and then we use those numbers from the graph. And I thought this was a good example for that reason. I found myself getting stuck and I thought, what am I gonna do? I'll look for information that's already in here and instead of guessing, basically. So a good learning point, use the, all the information available use anything that's in the CAP 698 if you need it. So anyway, uh, what were we? 25 degrees. So that's about here. And pressure altitude of 1,500 is going to be uh, just in this section B. Okay, so then we can use the B figures on the tables over the other side. Okay, so in table B, for 60,000 kilograms, so we're looking at V1 of 145, VR 148, and V2 155. So we've got a nice baseline. And then from that baseline, we can correct for the V1 adjustments because of slope and uh, wind. So the slope adjustment, we have um, to correct our 1% slope. It's a down slope, so we will decrease the value for 
it's two, so for one percent it must be one. So we'll take one of our V1 speed. And then for the knots, we have 50 knots, which would take three, but we only have five, or is it 10? Um, it's only five, <laughs> just forgot the answer there for a second. Um, so we take away another one knot, and it's uh, 143 for V1. So our answer is V1 of 143, VR remains 148, and V2 of 155. In this question, we're finding out the maximum takeoff mass limited by the brake energy speed given the following information. Elevation is 111 feet. We've got a 0.5% upslope. QNH of 1013.25. It's 41 degrees. Uh, V1 is 149. And we've got a 10 knot headwind. So we'll start off in the normal way by entering in what we know, which doesn't appear to be very much. Uh, which is actually only 111 feet and 41 degrees, which gives us one singular point here, which isn't even close enough to working out values for this graph. But what we can do is use our knowledge of the class A regulations. And we know that V1 has to be less than or equal to VMBE, because we have to be able to stop uh, without going over the speed that our brakes can handle, basically, which is what this um, restriction means. So therefore, we know that our VMBE has to be uh, at least 147 knots. It could be higher, but it has to be at least 147 knots. And then what we're going to do is we're going to further refine the VMBE figure. So a 10 knot headwind, as we can see here, means that we increase VMBE by three knots. So that means a new VMBE of 150 knots. And then we can correct for the slope as well. 1% upslope means two knots, so 0.5% would mean one knot. 151 knots will be our value for VMBE, which is just here. And then I'm gonna take that value across all the way here. And if we match it up with our line for our pressure altitude and temperature, we can see that it's well below the 68,000 value here which to me suggests that we can take off with more than 68,000 kilograms. And this is quite a strange question because in order to find this value, you would have already had to find other values. It's quite strange to be asking you this specific value, but the answers available included basically, it can't be determined what the mass is. The mass is the same as the maximum structural takeoff mass. And then one that said VMBE can't be lower than V1 and therefore takeoff cannot be commenced. And then that the value for M, uh, the maximum takeoff mass is in excess of 68,000 kilograms, which is what we've just found on our graph, which is 68,000 kilograms here. And if you work this solution out using the question bank, you'll see an explanation. And the explanation states that you should work it with the maximum mass, put the numbers in and you'll see that the VMBE uh, will not limit you, essentially, which means that you can go in excess of 68,000 kilograms. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, there you go then. That's how to use some of the graphs in the CAP698 document that relate to class A performance. It's obviously not gonna be all of them. It's quite a thick uh, book. There's a lot of pages in here, a lot of graphs, um, but that's just a flavor of how to use some of them and hopefully you'll see how I tackled some of the problems with those little tips and tricks, such as using the example question to guide you, using those lines that are already on the graph, reading all of the notes, and if you get stuck, go back and look up for clues, and also do these little error checks. If I've got a tailwind, I'll be going further along the ground, therefore following the line this way makes sense, rather than following it that way, or going to the reference line first, and things like that. Um, so the next thing I'll be doing will be a live stream of a performance exam so you can see how I'd go about tackling an exam as well as how to make loads of mistakes, I'm sure, and also use those mistakes to learn so that I am better off when it comes to the real exam.